<laughs> so, remember to check out edandethan.com for latest updates and email feedback at edandethan.com to tell us exactly what we're doing right and how fantastic our panelists were. Um, and yeah, mm-hmm. we'll do that. So, this is Ed and Ethan. You are still with Ed and Leith, and believe it or not, you're still here. It's incredible. Are you not amazed with the content so far? I am. I definitely am. <laughs> okay, Ed is. Ed, I'm, I'm going to just count you on the listeners though. now because you're, yeah, okay, you're a little bit biased. Uh, of course, uh, check out worldlibertynews.com where we've recently been syndicated. Also, lrn.fm, we've been add, uh, added to their Da-da. podcast lineup. Indeed, yeah, so thanks to Ian Freeman for that. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so we've been mentioning the interview again and again because we are obviously exceptionally excited about it. Uh, coming to us now from Houston, Texas is Stefan Kinsella. Stefan Kinsella is an attorney in Houston, director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom and editor of Libertarian Papers at uh, libertarianpapers.org. Uh, commonly featured on Mises.com. So, or Mises.org, I'm sorry, .org. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Stefan, thank you very much for joining us on the line today. How, uh, how does the day find you? Oh, it's a wonderful day here in Houston. I'm really glad to be here and uh, I'm excited to have a discussion with you guys. Fantastic. So now, Stefan, we're going to talk to you about IP, intellectual property, and uh, all of the various... I get, there are a lot of angles to this discussion mm-hmm, that we can is. take. Uh, but why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself first? I've given you an intro, but what is your role in the world of intellectual property? What, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I've been a practicing attorney for about 20 years, mostly here in Houston, a little bit in Philadelphia for a while. And most of that time, I've been a patent attorney, which mm-hmm. is a type of IP attorney or intellectual property attorney. I've also done trademark and copyright type work. Uh, but I'm heavily specialized in a very narrow field of patents, which is related to electrical engineering type uh, technology, primarily lasers and uh, computer technology, things like that. So I'm heavily specialized, which is how this field works. Uh, Patent attorneys, IP attorneys are very, very narrow and specialized in their fields um, because their work is highly technical. Uh, But for about the same amount of time, maybe a little bit longer, I've also been heavily involved in the libertarian movement, primarily from the theory kind of point of Mm -hmm. view. I've written a lot of uh, academic scholarly type articles on rights theory, legal theory, uh, economics, and the law. Uh, and I've been for a long time a, uh, a pretty uh, a devout Rothbardian, Austrian, anarcho-capitalist type mm-hmm. libertarian. Mm-hmm. So now how, and, how, does, how do yeah, you find ahead. being an IP lawyer <laughs> – <laughs> as as uh, well, I guess well, actually, let's let's yeah. get you to uh, elucidate just a little bit on what it is your uh, vision of intellectual property is. Do you think it's a, a kind of a valid claim that well, uh, well, the labor well, of one's brain is? is- yeah, well, let, let's let's maybe understand from a status perspective of what IP is and how. Um, right. statists see it or the, the government sees it, I guess. Let, let me tell you how I approached it from my own development. I mean, when I became okay. a budding libertarian and, you know, uh, in college and then in, in law school, um, you know, I assumed that intellectual property was a, a, a legitimate subset or type of property right, because many libertarians like Ayn Rand and others. Yep. Held that held that view, but I was always uncomfortable with it because something about it seemed a little bit different than their mm-hmm. other arguments because these arguments had a, might, more of a utilitarian or yeah. arbitrary strain because you're saying that you should have these rights for 17 years or 70 years <laughs> or whatever, but not forever and not for zero, but somewhere in between, and that just didn't seem like the regular arguments that libertarians made about natural rights that lasted forever. Um, and when I started practicing IP law because of just the way my career developed, I, of course, thought more and more about it. Like, is this type of thing I'm doing really – is this the way it would be in a free market, in a free society? Mm. And eventually, I came to my, my current view. is probably 1993 or so, so about 20 years ago. I finally gave up the ghost and realized, no, this is just a big mistake. Um, it's, <laughs> it was it sh- it too hard to deny now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of like when you become an anarchist, you kind of realize, oh, finally, I can give up the belief in the state. Yep. Um, <laughs> Let go of so it. So yeah. it was like that. It's, so so my, my view now, which is clear because I've thought about it for the last 20 years, um, is that really we've made a huge mistake in Western law. We, 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 we adopted these IP rights, patent and copyright primarily, 
like in the U.S. Constitution in 1789. We adopted yeah. them for sort of utilitarian reasons. And we thought we would encourage innovation by doing this. And this is, of course, not really a libertarian approach to law. But you determine what laws are just by deciding what's going to encourage what you want to encourage. That's more of a Chicago or, or wealth maximization or utilitarian approach. Well, let's actually let's, um, let's approach that specifically because you, you say sure. that one of the reasons that we go after IP is because we want to encourage innovation. One of the, one of the things that artists uh, see or innovators see is that when they innovate, they create a unique product, a unique idea. Yes. Uh, yes. They want to protect that idea so that uh, first off they can profit from it uh, as yes. as anybody should be able to profit yeah. from a product in the market and second so that they're able to uh, make enough profit that they're able to yes. continue innovating this is the argument so it why, sounds very legitimate yeah, on the why, why is why is that a flawed argument well I, okay so i think it's flawed for several reasons number one this is not how you decide what law should be law should be doing justice and ultimately that comes down to protecting property rights and property rights the entire purpose of property rights is to assign an exclusive owner to a given scarce resource that otherwise would have potential conflict over its use so that people can use these things peacefully so we libertarians tend to gravitate towards a roughly lockean idea that basically the entire idea of law and justice and rights is to say let's come up with a set of rules that allocates ownership of scarce resources so that people can use them peacefully and and um, uh, in a way that generates prosperity so they don't have to have conflict. So anything other than that makes no sense and is not the purpose of property rights. You don't say, we need to think about what's going to generate enough novels. Hmm. I mean, when you're designing a society, you don't say, we all know that we need 17,000 novels written per year per state, and if we don't have that number, we need to come up with a system to tweak it to make there be enough novels. <laughs> now, if, if you believe that novels and innovation and invention and scientific research is important, which I do, um, and if you thought that in a free society there would be zero artistic creativity, zero paintings, zero novels – then I suppose you would say there's something wrong with this system. Um, and that is the claim of some hyperbolic art, uh, proponents of IP. They'll say without IP, you would have no innovation. You would have no creativity. Hmm. But that is clearly absurd. I mean, you know, some of the greatest artistic works and scientific achievements of humanity were, were done in a pre-copyright, pre-patent age. Yeah, the works of Shakespeare. Go ahead. Stefan, I, I'd just like to bring up the example of the airplane with the Wright brothers. Yes. Mm. Um, do you want to expand on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so th that, that example, um, look, it's hard to argue that we would not have an airplane today in 2012 <laughs> if not for the patent system in the early 1900s. Uh, and in fact, of course, there were multiple simultaneous innovations going on in, in this whole field. Uh, the Wright brothers ex used the patent system to slow down the entire development in in, in, in what a patent does is it gives you a right to stop people from competing with you. Yeah. So that's what the right did. They, they exploited the patent system. They went to the patent office first, and they got these monopoly – government monopoly-enforced rights that allowed them to stop people from competing with them. Well, so for 10, 17, 20 years, you're going to have people – they're going to just sit back and wait because they can't compete with you. And you your incentive to innovate is diminished as well because you can rest upon your monopoly for – 17 or so years. And that's what happened. And when World War I struck, uh, the U.S. was actually un unprepared. Now, uh, my understanding is in Europe, because the patents didn't reach that far, there was more development at the time. But basically, the entire field of patents and the, the Wright brothers' patents slowed down and heavily distorted the entire field of aviation innovation for about a generation. Uh, and this example is multiplied uh, over and over and over. And um, uh, I mean, my, my previous point was is that no one can, with a straight face, argue that we would have no innovation or creativity absent patent and copyright law. Everyone knows that there would be some. So mm -hmm. the only argument they have is that there's not enough. But this is not the libertarian type of argument. I mean, the libertarian doesn't look at society and say the price of milk is a dollar twenty; it should be a dollar seven. Mm. We don't say that, and we don't say that there's 17,000 novels written last year in Texas. There needed to be 17,800. You know, and the only way you could criticize the existing free market order 
that doesn't have patent and copyright for not producing enough innovation is that if you know what the right amount should be. Further, and if you believe that the government can intervene and actually make it better, and it doesn't. My my view is that the founders were well intentioned. The U.S. founders they thought that maybe the government ought to have this policy tool in its arsenal of tools, and maybe it could stimulate some innovation with some reasonable utilitarian stimulations to you know inventors by giving them a little limited monopoly. But they had no empirical evidence to back to back this up. And the interesting thing is that in the two hundred plus years since, there has never been a single conclusive study even from an empirical or utilitarian perspective, that shows that it does. In fact, all of the studies that have been done keep concluding over and over and over again, either we can't figure this out, no one really knows, or it seems to us that probably patents and copyrights are heavily distorting the market and reducing the overall amount of innovation. Well, for, the very, at the very reasons. least, they've got to be distorting the market. That's at the very least. That's a mm-hmm. given because this is this is so great a, uh, a sort of regulation. It's so uh, so huge. It, 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 yes. it, the impact is is almost immeasurable. Um, uh, it, at least it sounds like it is. Anyway, I, I think it's immeasurable for Austrian reasons alone because you know subjective value uh, value is subjective and not interpersonally comparable. But even if you go with the Chicago kind of approach, and you try to measure everything in terms of dollars or, or some kind of a crude approach like that. All the studies show that there is tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of cost imposed upon the economy every year by, say, patent law. And in terms of copyright law, uh, the entire field of, 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 of artistic creation is distorted, uh, and civil liberties are threatened. In other words, you know the the U.S. and the Canadian and other governments are using copyright rights, which are fake rights, as an excuse to police the freedom of expression on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, copyrights are giving the government an excuse to increase the police state and to reduce internet freedom. Hmm. Do you My believe goodness. the internet is one of the greatest bulwarks of freedom? of all time, which I do, Mm -hmm. you do not want to give the government any excuse to regulate it. And of course they will, they will use pornography, kiddie porn, terrorism, online gambling, uh, and counterfeiting and piracy and intellectual property violations as an excuse to come in and regulate this tool, which is the biggest threat to their existence and their hegemony over, over mankind. A hundred percent agreement. Um, you talked, we were talking about the distortion of the market and I want to kind of get into uh, Samsung and Apple's uh, <laughs> patent disputes going on because it seems like there is a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of time and effort that is being battled out for in the court system. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess let's just talk about um, well, yeah, give us your perspective so, so, on that mess. <laughs> so, so, so you you asked earlier, like uh, how like someone like me would square being a patent lawyer with my my views, and in a way, it's hard, or in a way, it's distasteful, it, or in another way, it's just recognizing the fact that sometimes the institutional framework gives rise to certain needs. So, for example, in a free society, there would be no tax attorneys. Right, because there'd be no tax law. Yeah. There'd be no defense attorneys defending people against being thrown in a cage for selling marijuana. Mm. But given given that these laws exist, there is a need for people emerge that serve these needs. So you have defense attorneys, you have tax attorneys. And in today's world, if you are a medium sized or large sized company and you do not have a patent portfolio, you're basically defenseless. It it would be like it would be like the Soviet Union just giving up all their nukes unilaterally during the Cold War. Now, maybe they should do that morally. I don't know. I'm not an ethical okay. expert. Yeah. But if they had done it, then the United States would have had complete domination over them. But as it was, they had a stalemate. They had mad, mutually assured destruction. And this is what we have now. We have these companies, medium and large size companies. They have to acquire patents if only to defend themselves. In other words, if, if Samsung – let's say if Apple is going to sue Samsung for violating some of its patents on its devices for competing with it, basically, for, for copying what it's done, which is what the market process is about. right? In yep. other words, the, the entire patent process simply says 
we don't want to have unbridled competition. We don't want to have people competing too hard with each other. It's really unfair <laughs> for me to notice that you have come up with a way to satisfy consumers and for me to try to chip away at your profit. You have some kind of property right in your in your customers and in, in the profit. You have a property right in this. It's basically the old idea of mercantilism and protectionism. Um, so uh, if, if, if Samsung had – it could just be sued by Apple, they would just lose. So Samsung acquires thousands of patents on its own, and if they are sued by Apple, they can hunt through their stack of patents, try to find one that Apple might violate, and they can <laughs> counter sue. And so what happens is you have large companies acquire – I mean they spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on patent attorney salaries and filing fees and mm -hmm. engineer wasted activity to acquire these big arsenals of patents – and the primary purpose is to threaten small companies who have no defense. So they basically kill small competition yep. and to have a bargain with the other big guys. So what happens is Samsung and Apple and Motorola and Google and these few small players, they're going to end up counter uh, having a settlement with each other. I don't know which one's going to – who's going to pay each other a license at the end. It really doesn't matter because they'll just pass the cost on the, to the consumer. Yes. They'll rest upon their patentized oligopolistic monopoly. So you have two or three or four or five big players, and no one else can, can compete with them because no one else has a, an arsenal of patents that they can use as a bargaining chip. So they will just be sued out of existence. So if you have a, some small company of 10 engineers who have a great idea – they're screwed. They it's cannot like, compete. It's like an unintended yeah. cartelization of the market because you, we, we can look at instances where cartels have been flatly and plainly uh, endorsed by a government, but this is like a very unintended sort mm -hmm. of cartel, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Unintended by whom? I mean, well, I, think, <laughs> I think that the, the, the big players are perfectly happy with this system. They really don't care. You know, it's like the United States. If the United States loses a war like Vietnam or if the United States loses a war like Iraq – it doesn't hurt the United States government. It just gives them more power. They can they can they can use this as an excuse of why they're more, they're more needed than ever yeah. and why they need to raise taxes. So it kills soldiers, it kills civilians, but it doesn't hurt the government. And likewise, these companies like Apple and Samsung, they're sitting pretty because they have a greatly reduced competition. They only have to fight against each other, and they can make some kind of behind the scenes deal. And pay each other a five dollar a phone license or whatever and they go on about their business meanwhile it creates this walled garden where they have a cartel you're right or an oligopoly there um and and uh, uh so this is why i think we have actually less innovation and we have less competition and higher prices than we otherwise would have absent the patent system so what does uh if we look at things like trademarks uh this is another area of intellectual property right um mm -hmm. are do you think that trademarks are as much of a threat as patents are to uh, innovation no. or, or what, what, how would you categorize this no the the biggest threats are trade uh, patent and copyright and i would actually say copyright is a bigger threat because the term is so long and because it is giving the state the um uh, an excuse to come in and in, uh, regulate the internet. Patents are just about a two hundred billion dollar a year drag on the United States economy. Wow! Whoa. So it's it's like a, it's like a tax. I would say it's a huge tax on innovation and distorts, but it's just a tax. It's just a it's an unfortunate frictional cost. Uh, copyright is more of a civil liberties type thing, and I think that's actually worse. Trademark and trade secret and boat hole designs and database rights and moral rights and. Uh, semiconductor mask work protection, all these other weird IP rights that they keep coming up with, they are much more smaller fry. Um, in my early days, I would have said trademark is roughly libertarian because it ba its basic purpose is to prevent fraud. Right. Okay. But the more I look at it, the more I understand it. I think if that's really true, then we just need fraud law. <laughs> we yeah. can just get rid of trademark. Trademark has become horrible it's used to censor it's used to stop competition um so i would abolish trademark law as well uh, although it's not nearly as bad as copyright but trademark the idea is that if you deceive a customer about the nature of the product you're selling them then there's something wrong with that and we would all agree with that i believe 
Right. But the problem is the problem is that there's two fun. Well, let's say there's three fundamental problems with trademark law. Number one, it's statutory. It's it's legislative, and any genuine right doesn't need to be legislated. It could be it could be developed in a decentralized kind of common law court process. You don't need legislation. Number two. The, the, the cause of action is on behalf of the company that, quote, owns, unquote, the trademark. In other words, if Louis Vuitton, you know, the, the high, high-end high fashion purse seller, yep. um, sees some bootlegger who's making fake Louis Vuitton purses and selling them for $17 at the dock in Turkey, um, they can actually sue and get the government agents to go and seize all these fake purses and burn them on a, you know, Mm-hmm. on the altar of, of, of the state, even though, number one, the if there's allegedly fraud, it's being done upon customers, not, not Louis Vuitton. Yeah. And number two, there is no fraud because when you buy a fake Rolex watch or a fake purse for $20, you know that you're getting a fake. Mm-hmm. So there is no fraud whatsoever. So if you could remove from trademark law, number one, the fact that the trademark holder is the, is the plaintiff, it should be the customer. Hmm. Number two, it should only be when there's actual fraud, not when the customer himself is intentionally buying a fake purse or a fake watch. Uh, then you basically are left with nothing but fraud law, which mean, which leads, leads me back to my original observation that we only need fraud law for this. Mm-hmm. And even, even trade secret law, I would have a problem with. Trade secret law says that you have the right to keep things secret. Well, you don't really need IP law to say that. But what mm-hmm. trade secret law does is it gives you the right to go to court and ask a government court to issue an injunction against third parties, not even your employees or your former employees, that tells them you may not use the information that you just obtained from this former employer employee of, of the plaintiff. Um, and to my mind, that that, also, that itself is illegitimate because there is no contract between the trade secret holder and the competitor. So even trade secret law is problematic, although mm. it's much less much less unlibertarian than patent and copyright. We're speaking with Stefan Kinsella here, um, talking about IP. Now, Stefan, what is uh, – let's kind of get to the bare bones of what – a free market, what a free society, how a free society would really deal with, um, you know, patent copyright. I know we can't, you kind of actually, you know, I'd putting it in there, but like to break in real quick and, and mention, you know what? I'll, I would, I would bet. And I, I would theorize that <laughs> the largest, cause we mentioned Louis Vuitton, Gucci, yeah, Gucci, yeah. whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I would bet that they probably use those guys who are selling it at the docks in Turkey. I'd bet they use those guys for market research. Cause if, if they're selling a bunch mm. of Gucci stuff that probably means people really want gucci stuff right yeah, yeah. <laughs> well not, not not only that uh think about it this way um people always say that the problem with um works that are heavily dependent upon the the the, the pattern of the work in other words you know if you if you if you're making ships or airplanes i can't just go copy those that easily but if you're selling dvds or music files i can easily copy it or or place clothes fashion, cl- mm. clothing fashions. Yeah. So the idea is that if it's too easy for people to compete with you, then then they can compete with you really quickly, and you have no incentive to go into the business in the first place because you think that you're facing too much competition. Ah. But, the, but but the problem with that idea is that the entire way that this works is that there are billi- millions and billions of innovations and products introduced every day. And let's say you're a, you're an unscrupulous pirater. Who do you know who to copy, to emulate? You have to sit back and wait and see which of the billions of new products and ideas is going to be popular. Because you don't want to copy someone who's going to have no traction, yeah. right? So, so, so you see, you see a new clothing design is popular. It takes a while to notice that it's popular because it's not popular until it's popular for a while. Yeah. So let's say three, four, five months down the road, you see that this new design by Oscar de la Rente is popular, or the new purse by Louis Vuitton or whatever. Well, at that point in time, you might start making a knockoff. But by that point in time. The reason that you were knocking it off is because it's already popular. If it's already popular, that means that the original manufacturer has already sold a good deal of the product. Yeah, and, and most likely that the price is, is really heavily inflated because they have that monopoly on it and you're undercutting them with this so-called f- 
fake looking bag. Well, not so, only that, it actually helps them because the, the high fashion, you know, designers, they love the fact that there's high churn in the industry because their designs get outmoded every season. You know, first they, they're introduced on the runway, then they go to the high, the, you know, the high dollar shops. And then Walmart and JCPenney starts having knockoffs. So all these high dollar purchasers, they want the latest and greatest thing. Mm-hmm. So they're going to want the next design from Oscar de la Rente, right? And so this gives actually more value to the next the next iteration of the design from from the people that come up with the designs. It's a completely symbiotic relationship. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. This is competition. And yet we have people right now arguing that we should modify copyright law to include database rights. Okay, but what about well, – well, actually, this, this brings to mind something else. Let's, uh, let's bring up – because we're talking aesthetic design. What about uh, utilitarian design? So let's say uh, somebody has come up with the jet engine for the very first time and somebody else right. decides to copy it. What about that? I mean, is the jet engine designer, the original jet en- engine designer, not then placed at a disadvantage if we look at this from a free market perspective? Well, in a way, yes. Of course, the free market puts everyone at a disadvantage that's trying to compete in the market. And that's you mean just, there are winners and losers? <laughs> there are winners and losers, so that's the nature of the game. But uh, the field uh, – so you're talking about the field of patents. We talked about the Wright brothers earlier. Uh, in the field of patents, the uh, – look, in the field of, of, of novels and things, I would admit that it's very unlikely that anyone else would have written Atlas Shrugged like Ayn Rand did, for example, mm-hmm. or any other novel. Um not that that's that morally relevant, but still, there's a distinction. In terms of, of patents, it covers innovations, which are technological achievements. And basically, no technological achievement can come about until its time has come. In other words, until the, the field of the background theory and science has arrived at a certain point where you know, these guys could have come up with the idea. And almost always, this means that you're not the only guy that's going to come up with it. In other words – encryption or nuclear technology or lasers or cds or holographs whatever Mm. at a certain point in time the background technologies progress to a point where people's natural interest in selling new products coming up with new ideas this new idea becomes possible so almost in every case the, the the guy that is the first one to reach the patent office isn't the only guy who's come up with the idea and the idea would have come about anyway so you know, there's no reason to believe that without patents certain innovations would not have occurred hmm. so i guess what i'm getting here is just uh we get rid of the patent system a flurry of innovation takes place um, uh yeah. consumers benefit. It, 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 yeah in my view if we got rid of the patent system several things would happen number one patent lawyers like me would be out of work yeah, I mean, we, we'd be hired for 20 years to clean up the uh, the transition, but fine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think we would see two, three hundred billion dollars a year in the U.S. in the U.S. alone, let's say, freed up. Uh, you would see wow. less distortion, and you would see more innovation, and you would have more competition, lower prices, more rapid innovation, because you would have to always be innovating uh-huh. to keep your consumers satisfied. So everything would be better except for the portfolios of companies that are very large and dependent upon IP protection like Apple and Microsoft and maybe Samsung to some degree. So all the big players they go to the government and say give us this special right. So how do we yeah. how do we get how do what like is there a practical how, way yeah, we how can do we do get this? out of this like, giant trench that we've dug ourselves into because patents I mean, are I mean so, so, so I would say 15 years ago patent rights were bad and copyrights were bad, but they were like on the on the on the you know in the top thirty horrible things the government does to us. <laughs> but in my in my view today, because of the the pace of technology and the internet, I would say IP rights are the number six horrible thing the government does to us. The others mm-hmm. would be war, the drug war, taxes, the Federal Reserve, and central central banking, and things like that. Yeah. But basically, it's one of the it's one of the top five or six or seven things the government does to us. Um, so it is, it's become an extremely crucial and important thing. The, of course, the problem is that um, the, pe- the companies that have an interest in maintaining their, their IP hegemony, their IP monopoly position, are the ones that have the concentrated money to bribe Congress and the legislators and the parliaments. And the 
the harm is diffuse and spread across the country as a whole. So the opposition is weak. And not only that, the government has succeeded in this propaganda campaign. Look, originally, these rights were not called property rights. They were called what they are. The original basis for the patent system is in England in 17. I don't know, 23, I want to say, called the Statute of Monopolies. They admitted okay. that it was monopoly. Huh. Huh. Copyright was the Statute of Anne, and it was its purpose was to censor, you know, uh, Protestant speech. So, I mean, huh. you know, the, the, the origins of the things were clear, but in the 1800s where there was a debate, most of the economists realized that this is completely contrary to the free market. This is anti-competitive. The entire purpose is to reduce competition. And so they were debating this issue, and so the proponents of it started saying, well, it's just a natural property right. So they started calling it property as propaganda. Huh. So I believe that one thing we can do is to try to keep telling people this is not a natural property right. This is the government giving special privileges in response to you know the special interest groups and so, we just have to keep saying it's, this is not a property so, right. So, Stefan, see, I had a conversation last night. I had a couple of friends uh, just chilling, and we were talking about um, Apple and Samsung. And my one buddy was like, "It's like, dude, like it's a total copy." You know how? Do, what do I say to that? You know, I don't like. I I, I tried to explain like, you know, uh, like a coffee table maker makes the design of a coffee table. So then let's this they should sue each all each other because this basic design of this copy this table you know like but burger king and in and out it's yeah. time to go at it <laughs> yeah so, so I, I would say that uh, uh, they're buying into the propaganda which has got everyone to believe that it's okay to compete as long as you don't compete too much or it's okay to do something as long as in other words what if you said you can do whatever you want to do in your life you can use your body you can use your property as long as everything you do is is a new way of doing something. As long as you never learn anything from mm -hmm. anyone else, you mm -hmm. never copy anyone else. I mean, where does that even come from? I mean, th the implicit idea is that there's something wrong with competing with mm -hmm. people. There's something mm -hmm. wrong with emulating. But if you believe that, then you believe there's something wrong with the entire field of human knowledge and the idea that we have a culture and a body of economic and scientific and cultural knowledge that is – passed down from one generation to the next, and that grows with every generation. Actually, this is the glory of human civilization, is that every generation we advance. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a proponent of the weak theory of history, but there's something to it, the idea that every generation we have a greater body of knowledge to draw upon. We mm. all are beneficiaries of that. No one who innovates in art or in science or whatever is on their own. They're all standing on the shoulders of giants, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So the idea that there's something wrong with doing something that's copying someone else is just wrong. There is nothing wrong with copying. I, I think what we, may, what we may need to do is tell people you have to stop equating the idea of copying with stealing. So what mm. they do is they'll say that um, you stole my secret. I'm like, well, you know, I stole your girlfriend too. Did you own your girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> or I, st I stole your customers by competing. Did I? Did you own your customers? Well, and so that, that is the that's it. That is the assertion, though, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is because I lost yes. a sale because yes. of you. Yes. So that's the ultimate claim. So this goes back to the purpose of property rights is to protect ownership and control of scarce resources. Uh, and no, well, even potential. It's 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 the potential, right? Like you. Um, you're saying that um, if if you copy this and you're competing with me, you're I'm losing out on a potential revenue that I would normally yes. have. Yes, and I ridiculous. actually like that answer because that's an honest answer, and they're actually answering the question. So when you say <laughs> you say, well, what exactly did I steal from you when I when I copied you? They'll right. say, well, you kept me from making as much money as I could have, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, where 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 was that money going to come from? It was going to come from your customers. But you don't mm -hmm. own those customers. You don't own their decisions. And if they choose your customer, I mean, you could make the same argument about competition in general. This is exactly yeah. why the, the protectionism in, say, England and Europe in you know 400 years ago, the, the king or the crown was granting us favors. You get to be the only guy who can make playing cards, right? And the king's agents would actually go into the stores of competitors and say, 
if you're selling playing cards that don't have the seal of approval of the of the monarch, we're going to throw you in jail. So we have the police state being used to enforce mm-hmm. monopoly privileges, which is exactly what we have now because – there's really no difference. The, the only difference is it's more institutionalized. It's democratized. So in a way, it's more dangerous. Mm-hmm. Because back in back in 400 years ago, I'm pretty sure that the average person, if they could be aware of what was going on, would have seen a distinction between the state and its cronies and and the people that are being put in jail. Yep. But nowadays, it's all a democratized process, right? It's just it's a regular process that you you, you go to the government government agencies and you get this kind of right. Those damn public schools, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stefan, I'll tell you what. I, I, believe me, I'd love to keep going, but we we need to preserve time. But uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today. You've given me a lot to think about. There's a lot of really fantastic stuff. I'm definitely going to have to listen back to this again. Yes. Um, so, Stefan, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it. Stefan Kinsella, an attorney in Houston and uh, with libertarianpapers.org, an IP lawyer. Another great interview to wrap up uh, another awesome feature show, Ed. Man, I love this stuff. I oh, love yeah. this show. I love uh, <laughs> Liberty. Um, I hope uh, I love our listeners. I love our listeners, especially our listeners. Very cool. I hope, you know, we managed to bring them. You know, this was a really good interview. I learned a few things. I actually didn't expect a few of these answers because, you know, sometimes you wade into an interview and you're thinking, yeah, I know what's going to go on, right? Yeah. Well, but, that's that's the thing. You, we, you can read about this stuff, but when you have someone who knows what's going on, really knows what's going on, the ins and outs of all the technical crap, um, and you can ask them questions live, you know, that's you, you just learn so much. Oh, yeah. Awesome. No, it, it's. I'm really happy about this. Of course, uh, this closes out our show for today, our feature show. But stick around, depending on what platform mm-hmm. you're on and how it's delivered. Stick around for our B list, or find it in our uh, where it, it's, it's always in our YouTube channel at YouTube.com/slash Ed Ethan. Yep. Um, but yeah, so the B list is for stuff that we couldn't fit into the main show. Some of the other stuff that we'd like to get to. Of course, check out EdNethan.com for our latest updates. And also feedback at EdNethan.com is where you can send your suggestions, your praise, your condom nation whatever you'd like to send and also i will not hesitate to uh pick something to read on, on the air <laughs> once we get one thing be the first who's gonna be the first yeah are you gonna be the first the feel first. free to send some correspondence something you'd like read on the air be a part of the conversation i'd be happy to include you of course also thanks again to lrn.fm the folks the folks at uh, liberty radio network ian freeman and the gang uh, it's always it, it is a pleasure to be on their podcasting mm-hmm. uh roles and also uh world liberty news at worldlibertynews.com i think i covered everything yes, tonight i think so oh that might be a first Yahoo. where i actually managed to get Yay. everything awesome Good job, Ethan. <laughs> 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 All right. So for November 18th, 2012, this is Ed and Ethan.